Hi everybody and welcome to this episode of the Conscious Grief series. Today I am joined by Brianne Griebel and Brianne is an author, a poet and a transformation coach. Welcome Brianne. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really pleased that we're talking today because I haven't had an interview yet with somebody who's going to talk specifically on Alzheimer's and dementia, which is the topic that we're going to speak about. Mm -hmm. And such an important topic and so much, so much grief in this. Yeah. Yeah. So I would just wonder, first of all, if you could um, talk about the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia to begin with. Yeah. um... And I guess I'll, I'll briefly say the reason I know these things um, is that um, my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, what would that have been? Um, 2015, uh, she was diagnosed at the age of 62 and she passed away five years later. Um, and I kind of uh, uprooted my life to um, become her, her part-time caregiver, uh, caregiver along with me and my father. We took care of her for as long as we could and we did eventually have to move her into a care facility um but it's uh it's uh it's quite a journey (laughs) um and um, a lot of people don't know the difference between alzheimer's and dementia so alzheimer's um it's it's kind of it's hard to actually diagnose it's one of those things that we're not sure we we've tested for all of these other things and nothing has come back as to be able to explain your cognitive dysfunction so the only thing that's left for us to say is it's probably Alzheimer's. Um, Alzheimer's has dementia as a part of it. So dementia tends to be more of a symptom, whereas Alzheimer's is kind of like this overarching category. It's not, it's not really a disease, but it's kind of what we call this um, uh, grouping of symptoms, one of which is often dementia. So dementia um, is quite often um, memory loss in varying degrees. Um, Some people have it worse than others. Um, My mother who had Alzheimer's and then um, later we we didn't have have her officially diagnosed, but we think she also had Lewy body dementia, which affects a different part of the brain. So for my mother, not only did she lose a lot of memory, she got, um, she had a lot of hallucinations, a lot of, just really being unaware of her surroundings, seeing things, hearing things, um, a lot of severe mood shifts. Um, so, so dementia is more of a symptom and can be a part of Alzheimer's, but you can have dementia for a lot of different reasons. Like I said, there's Lewy body dementia. Sometimes you can have dementia as a result of a, a brain injury. Um, but yeah, that's usually what it is, is dementia is kind of this term that relates to um, cognitive dysfunction. So your, your mind is just not working in the way that it used to. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for clarifying that. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about your mom just now. So when your mother was first diagnosed, how did you, and you mentioned you have a brother, how did you first respond and decide how you were going to cope with the situation? Oh gosh, it was really tough. So um before she was diagnosed, um, back in 2015, I had a lot of, um, I lived in a different state. We're in the U S my mother was in the state of Idaho. I was in California and, uh, a lot of friends and family that were still with her had mentioned, you know, something doesn't seem right with your mom and your dad seems to be having a hard time, um, with her. So I went up, um, to kind of see if I could help with anything I had at the time I was fresh off of a, a nutrition background and, had some schooling and I thought, well, oh, she's probably just not eating right. I'm going to go up and I'm going to, I'm going to fix her. (laughs) Uh, It'll just take a few adjustments and she'll be right on track. Uh, And when I got up there and and saw, you know, spent a lot of time with her, I spent several months with her and I just thought, oh, this isn't what I think it is. And we went through a lot of different doctor visits um, and finally came back with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And that, that for me is when the, um, the first, punch in the face of grief kind of hit me because the first thing I had to grieve was the the understanding that I can't this is beyond me I can't I can't do anything I, I tend to have like a, a fixer personality <laughs> um and there was nothing I could do um at the time though she was still 
fairly functional. And um, I moved, I went back to California uh, and just kind of watched every time I would go back to visit, there would be um, a steeper and steeper decline. And then it started to happen pretty fast. Uh, and the, um, I wanna say late 2018, I just realized, I began to see the toll it was taking on my father. Um, it was, it, it had aged him 10 years in a couple of months. And I just realized he couldn't do it on his own. He was having a hard time. Um, and I happened to live a life in which me kind of uprooting and moving somewhere else was not that difficult. I do have a brother and he didn't have that. He had a job where he had to be present and, um, you know, he owned his home and, you know, I was renting and my husband um, is also not location specific. We can kind of be anywhere. So I, after, you know, conversation with my husband, we made the choice to kind of pack up our lives in California and go to Idaho. And um, I feel very fortunate in that I had, I wanted to do that. Some people, it's, it's too hard for them. And I have a whole lot of um, empathy and compassion for people who it's too much for them. I, I just knew this is something I need to do. Like I couldn't not do it. And I had the ability to do. Uh, a lot of people would want to, but their lives are such that it's just entirely, it's just so difficult. You know, they might have jobs where they have to stay there or children that need to stay in school or, or a, a lot of different things. So um, it just kind of, you know, this is something that I need needed to do, knowing full well, it was probably gonna be the most difficult thing that I'd ever done. And it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, because, you know, you describe the process um, with words like, you know, it's cruel, it's ugly, it's really hard. And it really you are, is. Yeah. So would you like to share a little bit about that process of really looking after and nursing your mom while she was in decline? Yeah, um, it's it's something you can't there's no training there's no there's no truly preparing for that um the only thing i can tell anybody who's going through a similar journey is to, you just have to to the best of your ability to be able to learn as you go to to know that there's no right way to do it <laughs> there's it's going to be ugly it's going to be messy it's going to be confusing it's going to be difficult and you have to within yourself find a level of grace with the whole thing to be able to just show up anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing I learned very early on is, um, you know, to, I, I, there, uh, the internet is full of um, great resources and ideas of like, you know, do these things in this sort of way and do, try to avoid doing this. And that's all helpful. Um, but above all, if um, you can just find grace, if you can find your way to patience as much as possible, mm -hmm. knowing full well that you're going to have moments where you're burnt out. You're going to have moments when you're overcome with grief. You're going to like those moments are, it's just part of it. I always tell people feel it as it comes and let it, let it like, it doesn't do any good to like bottle it up and package it away. You know, you're going to have to do what you have to do. You know, to, I had to, at the, uh, my mom became incontinent. So, you know, we, I had to, I had to bathe her and dress her and change her often because she didn't know when she had to go to the bathroom. So she would just go. Um, we had to feed her near the end. She couldn't work utensils or anything. Uh, it's, it's trial by fire. Like you learn as you go, like you, you learn, oh, today, this seems to work better than that. Like if I say these things, um, she responds better than those things, but that might change tomorrow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. A, uh, I guess I, I would say it, an emotional flexibility. Right. <laughs> it will be the, the best tool that you have because mm -hmm. you're going to go from, you know, here to there, from A to Z and back again every single day. So be able, being able to just feel your way through that, accept that you're not going to get it right. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. um, and love as much as possible, find love for the person you're caring for, love for yourself, grace with the whole thing. It's completely unfair. It's, it's like I said, it's, it's cruel, it's vicious, it's, it, nobody deserves it, and yet there it is. Mm -hmm. Like, 
it's still there in front of you. Right. Um, yeah. And like you uh, explaining it, all of those processes, you know, which we commonly feel when somebody has died, you're feeling them while the person is still here living yeah. in some capacity. And so this grief is ever present and ever changing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's um, anybody who's gone through something similar can, knows that. But if you haven't gone through it, it's, it's, you can describe it, but it's not the same as, as feeling it. Like you grieve so many things along the way. I had to grieve, um, you know, the loss of a relationship with a person I'm, I'm still, it's still there. I'm ter- like, we, there came a point where she didn't know who I was. Um, luckily up until the very end, I think she had an awareness of, oh, this is somebody who cares for me and that I care for. I think that was still there. Um, but she didn't know I was her daughter. So there's a grief of a loss of a relationship. There's a grief of, um, <clears throat> sometimes the emotions still <laughs> overtake me a bit. Um, there's a grief of an imagined future. Like I had this whole idea of like the relationship I would have with my mother as an adult, you know, an adult relationship with my mom. I was looking forward to that. And I had to grieve that even though she was still there. Uh, you know, you have to, there are so many things that you have to recognize that isn't anymore. That possibility is gone. This is gone. Our history is gone because she couldn't remember anything. So the future, the history, <laughs> is all gone and there's so much to grieve. And then ultimately when she's gone, you know, my father and I talked about this, you know, at first there was relief because she was suffering very much at the end. Um, And so when she was gone, there was actually a a lot of relief at first, like this is done for her, for us. And I would say the grief of her actual passing didn't hit me until maybe even six months to a year later. you know it's like a whole other layer it's like and there's a recovery of being a caregiver it takes its toll on you there's and then the funny thing is is you grieve taking care of somebody (laughs) you know being her caregiver gave me a very different purpose in life that I'd never had before and it felt like for lack of a better word a very noble one um you know I am here to care for this woman who cared for me for so much of my life and I um a deep part of me kind of rose to the task. And then I, so I had this, and then the person I was giving this kind of caring for was gone. And so now that was disorienting. (laughs) So there's just layers, so many layers involved in the process. Um, And I think the best thing anybody can do is to meet each one as it shows up, because again, I always come back to the word grace. I never really had a relationship with that word before all of this, um, but I have no better word for it of, um, you know, something else other than the person who is mourning has mm-hmm. to show up. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know how a word for that, but that's, there, there's a grace that shows up in place of like the, the person who is mourning couldn't have taken care of her. It was too hard. So there, that person was there. The person who was grieving was absolutely there, but then something else showed up and went, okay, while well, you're mourning, I'm going to make sure she's fed. I'm going to make sure she's safe. I'm going to, you know, try to calm her down as she's screaming like I'm you know uh, and I do think we all have that within us um if we can just kind of meet life where it is right. and I, do, I, I don't I don't have a technique for that per se <laughs> but I do think we will all find our way to it mm, well I mean I know that you had said that you know not everybody is in a position to be able to care for their loved ones as you did but I still really acknowledge you for what you did and changing your life and looking after your mum in those last years because that is a very noble and extremely loving thing to do and very very difficult thing to do and like you say there's um this part of you that's sort of like mourning at the same time as having to be in action and having to be the caretaker and not being able to sort of fall apart. Um, And so the relief makes complete sense. And also the time span, you know, being later on that you started to grieve. And how was it sort of grieving 
because obviously the the, the recent memories of your mum were when she was not herself really you know the person that you knew her to be before the dementia so was that complicated as well sort of getting back to the memories of her before she was unwell or was that quite yeah it's it, it is tough it's it, it, um you know I, I hadn't thought about it until somebody else that I know who had gone through something similar she and I had been talking um, and she said that she hated that her most powerful memories of her mother were at, you know, the quote unquote worst part of her life. And, and I, I didn't realize that was true for me too. Of course, they are the most recent memories. Um, but, and, and it's, some days I, that bothers me that the clearest memories, the strongest memories are, um, of her when, she didn't know who I was, um, but at other times, um, you know, I, um, I mean, not to skip ahead, but I, 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 uh, I wrote a book about the experience with her and um, I wanted to do that because, and I wrote it before she passed and I wanted to do that because there was something that I was, I wanted to express that I was experiencing through this journey with her that even though this disease was there and even though I hated it um, and even though I was losing parts of her, the, our relationship had never been stronger. Um, there was, it, it's really interesting. And I, and I wrote a chapter about this. Like she, um, she started to lose language so she was still very verbal, but it was um, just jump on the surface. It was just gibberish. Uh, but we had the most beautiful conversation because we weren't worried about understanding each other mm. in that sense of like, I didn't have to worry about what exactly she was trying to say. And I know she couldn't understand. And so it was, it was just pure connection. You know, it wasn't a, a cerebral, it wasn't a like, oh, I want to make sure I don't say the wrong thing. And, you know, she doesn't worry about me trying to understand. It was like, it's just pure connection. It was just like stating and acknowledging. I'm here, you're there, you're there, I'm here, here we are. And the words didn't really matter. And it was, again, it's, it's this weird, interesting, like duality of like, this is the most horrible thing I've ever experienced. This is also the most like, beautiful connection I've ever felt. Um, you know, and that was a really, that's a mixed bag. <laughs> that's really hard to deal with. And so, so that, you know, my, the strongest memories of her aren't really the mom that I knew. Part of me is okay with that because I know in her final years, we had an extremely beautiful connection. Even if she didn't cognitively put words to it, I know that she felt that connection, you know? Yeah. It's it's obvious to me that it's like there's no possible way it could it only be one sided, <laughs> you know, um, and so yeah, it's like I say, it's, it's a weird, like I hate it and it's okay. <laughs> I I remember hearing recently that what you're sort of describing like these two polar opposites, and when we we can sit with two polar opposites and for them to both be true, it's a sort of a very I got emotionally mature place to, to be. Well, that's a good way to put it. Boy, did that um, experience with my mom really emotionally mature me. <laughs> it's kind of the only, they're suffering through it no matter what. If you love the person, it's, that's just it. There's no way, there's nothing that makes it easy. There's nothing. And I don't ever want to try to tell anybody that don't worry, it's okay. Or, um, you know, you can love your way through it. And, um, you won't suffer. You, if you love them, you will. That's, I mean, but that's love. That's the other side of love. I don't know why life is created that way, but you get love and then you get lost. Yeah. Um, but it's almost like to not suffer with your suffering. Mm -hmm. I think the only way to do is one is to be able to see that there, there are, there is always, if there's ugliness, there's also beauty. I think that I didn't really know that before this experience, but my mom, that experience made it very clear to me. Like if I could see something beautiful in the most horrendous thing I'd ever experienced in my life, it must be true of all of life. Mm -hmm. That just became clear to me. So the first thing is being able to see that. And then the next thing is being able to hold that. 
Hmm. You know, I, again, I don't know how one does that, um, but I know it's possible. I know it's absolutely possible. Um, and that's the thing that makes the grief easier to carry. It doesn't take it away. You know, I think we all know that intellectually, I think once you, it, once you get to at least a certain age, you know that there are things that are just going to be painful in life. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think we do, like, I know that you can't avoid the pain, but we still try. <laughs> we are high, hardwired to try and avoid pain, I think. Um, but after I saw how beautiful a painful experience would be, I don't, I think I try less. I try to avoid it less. I, I, I am able to, because of my mother and because of that experience, I am able to sit with harder stuff more easily, I guess. Yeah, I, sh I should imagine you are definitely after this experience. Yeah. And you started to share that um, you were writing your book before your mom passed. So Love Doesn't Care If You Forget is the name of your book. I don't know if you have a copy near you. I meant to grab one before I came upstairs uh, and I totally forgot. Shame on me. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking before, I'm like, remember to take a book upstairs. <laughs> it's just such a beautiful title. And I know that you are a very gifted writer. So did writing, well, I imagine writing was something very supportive. Absolutely. Um, it was pure catharsis. Um, I started writing, they were just Facebook posts, sharing the experience, like not, but not just the details, sharing, like doing my best to put into words what I was seeing through the journey, like not hiding the difficult stuff, but seeing like underneath this layer of suffering and struggle and pain, there was something else that I had access to. And I, I really tried to put into words, like, what is this that I'm seeing? And they were just Facebook posts to start off with. Um, but they really resonated with people. I would get, you know, 200 comments on a Facebook post and I would never, that's, I never get, ever get that before. And so I started to realize, oh, there is a value beyond just the catharsis. Like that was just for me to start off. There was something, um, I do love language and trying to find words for things that you can't really put words to is, is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a very worthy topic and it just, when I would find a way to express something I was seeing, it just, it would just make things feel a little bit better. And then as I was posting them publicly, I realized, oh, this is something a lot of people can relate to, even if they haven't gone through this particular experience, there's something that's really resonating with people. Um, so then I decided to kind of um, expand on those original posts and put it into a book. So it's, it's called Love Doesn't Care If You Forget, um, Lessons of Love, from Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's based around five, five lessons, that kind of find five main themes that I saw um, as I was taking care of my mom. And they're very short, it's a short book, um, which uh, is on purpose because it's, it's a beautiful book. It's, it's ultimately about love and hope. But if you're experiencing something similar, it's painful, even though it's a, I think it's a rather beautiful book. I wanted it to kind of be a, a small dose, <laughs> you know? five like the chapters are you know a few pages you can go and get something and then you can set it down and maybe get a breather or <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um and quite honestly if you are the caregiver of somebody who has alzheimer's dementia you don't have time to read a big book anyway so <laughs> yeah. it was very purposefully a very short little book um and i'm very proud of it and uh, you know now that she's passed i would probably write a whole different one mm -hmm. um but I was, it was felt really important to me to, to put that into the world while I was seeing it, knowing that when she was gone, I would see things differently and either make another one or, you know, mm. um, but yeah. And so how have you been since she passed? Oh, you know, it's, it is really, and I think this is anybody who's lost, not only any one, you can grieve anything, anything that you've loved. There's grief when it's gone and ultimately everything in this existence comes and then it goes. Um, I think it's pretty similar in that, you know, um, it never really goes away and the most, you know, random things, you know, I'll be going along and then something will just slug me in the face <laughs> and I'll just be a puddle of tears thinking about mom or, you know, something we experienced or, um, and, you know, for quite a while, I couldn't, I couldn't talk about it. I was very vocal, you know, I, I did the writing, I talked about it. 
Um, and then when the book came out, I was on a lot of podcasts talking about it. And then after she passed, I couldn't, I, for about a year, I said, I can't, I can't talk, I'm done. Um, and it's only recently that um, I realized I, I could still talk about it. I just, I just needed a break. <laughs> I needed to kind of process and, and feel without finding the words, you know, let it be internal. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your mom uh, mm. as a person and as a mom. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Jaylene. Her name was Jaylene. Um, she was this interesting. She was super shy and bashful. But once you got her, got her out of her shell, she was the life of the party. She loved to laugh. She was an easy laugh. That was one of the favorite things about my mom. It was so easy to make her laugh. And for a very long time with the dementia, um, it was easy to make her laugh. And that was one thing I was very, very grateful. It got easier. You know, I, um, before I moved to be with her, we would FaceTime and I would just make a funny face and it would send her into fits of laughter. I would make a silly noise. Um, so I was, I was very grateful for that. But yeah, she was really sweet. She was super kind. Um, you know, she was kind of the kind of person that would, you know, always help a friend in need. Uh, she and my father had been together since they were um, 15. So they were in high school, sophomores in high school, got married when they were 21. So they had been together for decades. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were quite a pair. <laughs> and how's he been doing? He's good. He actually just recently started dating, which was a whole other experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he, she passed away in July, 2020. It's been almost two years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, he, it was very sweet. He called me to ask if it was okay. And uh, I was like, yeah, I just want you to be happy. He was like, you know, she's been gone a couple of years. He's like, but I lost her a long time before that. Mm-hmm. Like I lost her years before she died. Um, and he did a beautiful job of caring for her to the best of his abilities. Um, and so, you know, it, it was very hard for him, I think, for the first year. I mean, he had to, um, he was a hard worker, and then he went straight from working to taking care of my mother. And so he had his own kind of identity crisis when um, it started when we moved her into a care facility. So he had, he actually had time on his hands again. Yeah. Um, but we visited every day. And then when she passed, you know, it's a whole different, it's, it's interesting to think about like my grief will, would be different than his, his grief, very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has his own identity crisis, but he's kind of coming out of it now. And that's, that is something I think also worth sharing. Um, I, I have a friend going through a similar experience and he, we were, as I was talking about my father and him starting to date again, um, that really perked him up. He's like, we're nowhere near that. He's like, but it is nice to remember that there is a life after loss. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, there's no time frame. You know, you can grieve for however short or however long it, it comes up through you. But there, there is, you know, sometimes it's um, annoying to think about that. If you're kind of in the middle of it, thinking about life going on <laughs> when you're really in the middle of it, it's like, I know I want everything to stop while I go through something so horrible. Everything should just stop. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's nice to know you won't stay there. Yeah. Like there, there will be more beauty. There will be more laughter. There will be more love. And the grief will just be along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really beautifully said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, um, I like to always ask people what your interpretation of conscious grief would be. Oh, interesting. I've never been asked this question. Um, It's a beautiful question. Thank you for asking. Um, hmm. Just the, just the, I've never heard the concept conscious grief before. Um, And just the, the kind of pondering it, it feels kind of nice in a way. It's to me, if I hear that, it feels like, um, shaking hands with grief like you're here I acknowledge you I'm, I'm not denying you I'm not hiding you I'm not pushing you away um, you're here 
And so we're going to sit together and just until you leave, knowing you'll probably be back. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a huge advocate um, of in whatever way works for you, learning how to feel what you feel. Mm. I think personally, and this is just a personal thing, finding the language for it is very valuable. There is something about taking this kind of intangible, these this sensation and finding a word, whether it's just being able to name what you're feeling um, or talk about it. I think there is something that it just makes the energy feel like it's moving, moving through you rather than pummeling you. Now it may feel like it's moving through you like a fire hose, (laughs) or it may feel like it is actually coming, pummeling you, but it's, it's the difference of knowing that you will get through it versus feeling like this is going to be the end of me. Mm. you know whatever you're feeling let it like let yourself feel you know to be all perfectly honest I think it's also really important to acknowledge when you're going through something extremely difficult to let yourself feel joy when joy shows up as well we had so much laughter in the last years of my mom's life and part of me in the beginning kind of started feeling like oh this is really bad we shouldn't be laughing about this but then I realized like two sides of the same coin. Let, let yourself feel joy. Don't feel guilty about joy. Like even if you feel like you should be grieving or that you should be serious or let the emotion be there, you know, the happy ones, the sad ones, the painful ones, the happy ones. Um, so yeah, conscious grief to me is just acknowledging the grief, um, kind of shaking hands with it and almost partnering with it for as long as it's there. I love that. Thank you. And I also wanted to just um, mention how, because you told me that you became uh, part of this huge Facebook group. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, And of course, I've forgotten. So um, I did create a website called loveanddementia.com. I'm not active on the site currently. It's still up, though. Um, and the reason I keep it up is because there's a, a, a page of resources on there that a lot of people have told me very, are very helpful. So loveanddementia.com slash resources. Um, and there is a Facebook group that I link there that um, at the, I just looked a couple of weeks ago. There's 50,000 people in this Facebook group. And I have never seen a Facebook group so large be so loving. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a great I can't even like hearing a lot of people kind of just go and lurk. They just kind of read. Um, But even that I think is very helpful, like understanding you're not alone. You're not the only person in the world who's going through this. Um, It's a great place to vent, um, you know, because there's a lot of times, you know, I just, I just wanted to talk about how crappy this is. And I didn't want anybody to tell me like, it's okay. Like, I just, like, I just want to be angry. <laughs> and it was a great place to just be angry. And people go like, I hear you. I know, I know what you're going through. Uh, it's a great place to ask questions of like, even like um, practical things, like, you know, what has everybody done to help, you know, bathe your loved one when they don't want to get there? There's a lot of, and sometimes if you just want support, there's a lot of, I never knew how helpful it would be to hear strangers say, you know, I see you. I'm sorry. It sucks. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge, huge help just hearing other people's stories. So that Facebook group is there um, and there's other resources as well on that page. Um, so that's, I, like I said, that I'm not active on the website anymore, but I'm keeping it up strictly for that, for that purpose. Okay, that's a really great resource. Thank you for sharing that. And lastly, I just, you know, you've shared so much wonderful um, knowledge and learnings. And I know that, through a little bit that I've read that you know that well even with with what your the title of your book and love and the things that you found but perhaps you could just um, wrap up with sharing what what gifts there has been in this difficult circumstance I guess um, the way I would say it today (laughs) Um, I say it different all the time Um, the thing going through this with my mom who i loved more than anything um still do obviously um i got i began to see my version of what holds us you know i'm not a a religious person per se um but it's like to me like there's something that holds us that is permanent um and inside of that that 
holding is the experience that you're going through. It's the happy times, it's the sad times, it's the relationships, it's, you know, everything. But once all of that like gets peeled away, like once you don't get the memories anymore, once you don't get that relationship anymore, once once life starts taking away, the, the thing that gets stripped away is solid and it's unmovable and it holds you. And I my word for that is love. Um, somebody else might use God, somebody else might use something else. It doesn't really matter to me, but the experience with my mom gave me a tangible experience of the thing that doesn't change. As her mind was changing, as our relationship was changing, as her abilities were changing, there was something that didn't. Um, and that gave me a very different foundation for the way that I moved through life. When you see, when you find firm ground, um, it just it just gives you a different set of bearings, I guess. And that's the experience I got from my mom, from that, from walking with her through her dementia and her Alzheimer's. Wow, that's amazing. And I feel like that's a real testament also to the relationship and the family that, that you have. Yeah. Um, Brianne, is there anything else that you would like to share before we close? Um, oh, I did want to mention, um, and we had talked about, uh, there's also, if you want a free chapter from the book, um, I'm making that available. It's at loveanddementia.com slash chapter. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to get a little mini taste, the chapters kind of stand alone. So um, you can get a, a taste of kind of one of my, the favorite lesson of mine, um, if anybody reading wants to get a bit of that. Um, the, the thing I would say is anybody going through an experience like this, um, to the best of your ability, find some version of support. It can be a very isolating journey for a lot of different reasons. Um, it can, it's just time consuming. If you're a caregiver, uh, it's emotionally isolating because a lot of people can't relate. Um, the experience we had is a lot of people that were close to my mom kind of backed away. Um, and I have full compassion for them. It's, it, it's, if you don't know what to do, sometimes the easiest thing is to not mm -hmm. be there. And some people are afraid of making things worse. Or some people once like, oh, my, my friendship isn't there. I don't know how to be with this person anymore, you know. Um, I get it. So it can be very isolating. So whatever you can do to, um, and it's easier said than done, I know, but ask for help, ask for support, even if it's online in that Facebook group. Um, if you have the resources to hire help, I know that's privilege for a lot of people, but if you do have those resources, um, do look into any kind of government aid that you can find wherever you're at. Um, and you know, it, do it as soon as possible because as it goes along, it gets harder. So, uh, and just know you have my absolute compassion and love and, and um, you know, I wish everybody the best you might be going through it. Yeah. Oh, Brianne, this has just been such a wonderful conversation. Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity. Not at all. So people can find you at loveanddementia.com is the best place. Well, that's, that's, uh, I'm at briangriebel.com is kind of where I'm active my, yeah. at my name, but you can, I, I highly encourage for this specifically to go over to loveanddementia.com for the resources for the chapter. Um, and there's a few other things on there that might be helpful, but you're not going to find me there. <laughs> <laughs> and will. my social media, uh, my Instagram is where I'm most active. So it's just briangriebel. And we'll put um, a link below this as well to the free book chapter and your sure. website yeah so thank you very very much thank um, you thank you and to everybody that's been listening or watching thank you also lots of love bye bye